Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to Profiling Evil Season 3, The Academy Session. We're going to be covering a lot of territory in these series, everything from criminal behavior to the origins of criminal behavior and the risk factors. And we're going to make a closer examination of some of the specific kinds of crimes that are plaguing law enforcement. Things like substance abuse, violent crime, the psychology of modern terrorism. Now, if you're new to Profiling Evil, I hope you're going to take a moment and hit that like and subscribe button. And for my university students, those of you who are returning to the classroom, thanks so much. It's great to have you back, and I look forward to providing additional insight into your criminal justice studies. Again, to those who are Profiling Evil members, welcome back, and thanks so much for supporting us. Now, let's get started. In this particular segment, we're going to spend some time talking about some of the causes, manifestations, and the developmental pathways that are in, used in understanding criminal behavior. Crime really intrigues people for some reason. I mean, for some of us, it really draws us in. Like the need we have to look closer at an accident as we drive by. Or that thing that causes us to stop and peer past the yellow crime scene tape in hopes of seeing what's happening on the other side. For other people, crime can be revolting. And occasionally, our responses might be curiosity and repulsion at the very same time. Well, in this first segment of Season 3, we're going to look at the perspectives that can impact our study of crime and criminals. We're going to talk about a few theories that might explain why crime happens. And we'll talk a little more about the differences between criminology, sociology, and psychology. Now, I'm not an expert in these areas, but I have read a lot, I've studied a lot, and I've worked along some of the most brilliant psychiatric minds in the world. Hey, we'll even throw in a little bit of psychiatric consideration into the mix, including looking at things like juvenile crime and into the measurement techniques that are used in understanding crimes. Now, crime simply is defined as the violation of statutory or common law, resulting in the risk of punishment. Although most crime re requires the element of intent, I, I wanted to do this, I meant to commit this crime, there are some crimes that can be committed even though the actor didn't even think about it, didn't have a mindset for it, but nonetheless they committed it. An example of this might be you and me when we pull into a parking spot and we didn't see the no parking sign. We end up getting the citation, it's a crime, but it doesn't require that the prosecuting attorney necessarily establish that we intended to park uh, illegally. Now, that's a lot different. Some crimes, like illegal parking, are simply prohibited by statutes, but they're not inherently evil. Other violations, on the other hand, are considered evil under normal community standards. Now think about this. All crime is going to be prosecuted by government attorneys. These attorneys can represent cities. They'd be called a city attorney. Makes sense, doesn't it? The county attorney representing a county or a larger district uh, might also be called a district attorney, depending on uh, the makeup of that government. A state will have a state attorney, a, an attorney general. I used to work for the Attorney General, or the federal government would have the U.S. Attorney's Office. Now, some examples, again, might be county attorney, city attorney, attorney general. But crime, crime is ranked in seriousness by classifications. To start at the bottom, it would be that parking citation, uh, something we would call an infraction. Let's escalate a little bit, and let's talk about the guy who steals... Oh, let's say something from the hardware store. That's going to be a misdemeanor unless it hits a certain financial level. But the more serious crimes, especially crimes involving persons, 
are going to be felonies, and these are, without a doubt, the most serious. Now, there are a lot of theories around crime causation, and some of the experts rely upon these really detailed models to graphically define and describe them. Crime modeling is a relatively new classification strategy, and it has theories that are based on classical thinking, theoretical thinking, and free will behavior. Now that said, it's important to realize that criminal and civil laws are rooted in the belief that individuals are masters of their fate, that we choose to do what we're going to do or what we did. And once we choose, we are again free thinking and responsible people who are responsible for the choices that we made. This idea that the devil made me do it just doesn't work in a courtroom. Now, there are times when uh, a reflex might work, but when considering how to stop crime, there are theories that are deployed by law enforcement and criminal justice around the world. Things like the deterrence theory, which assumes that crimes can be minimized through some kind of a design. Placing a surveillance camera on a street corner can cause a criminal to reconsider committing that crime, to rethink about it, (laughs) at least in that particular area. Now, police crime prevention units have long believed and have long persuaded uh, businesses to adopt something called crime reduction through environmental design. Now, putting more lights on a building can certainly eliminate dark areas, and eliminating dark areas can certainly eliminate a criminal's desire to be hanging out there, especially if there's a camera present. Putting motion sensors and lights and cameras on a building is another strategy. Another might be the deployment of speed trailers, These are those devices that run radar on vehicle speed without a police officer being present. Usually they have a little sign next to it that says what your speed is and what the posted speed limit is. A reminder to slow down. Now other examples might be those photocop cameras that take photographs of your vehicle running red lights or speeding. That automates this process of sending a traffic citation to the owner of the car. Now, for my friends in France, I just kind of consider this a uh, excise or visiting tax whenever I come to France, because it seems like, especially if I'm if I'm driving from like Paris out to uh, um, Saint Michel or something like that, I always get dinged by those uh, speed cameras out on the freeway. And I always get a hefty fine to pay, but I figure it's just my travel tax. Anyway, it's believed that these kinds of deterrents will stop somebody from committing a crime. And I don't know about you, but they certainly stop me when I know that they're there. I always think a little bit more about it. Now, there are two authors named Kurt and Ann Bartle who have a book called Criminal Behavior, A Psychological Approach. And they provide some really insightful perspectives on the discipline deployed in understanding crime. The Bartles suggest that primary disciplines in crime research and analysis are those found in the fields of sociology, psychology, and psychiatry. In recent years, more disciplines have been introduced into the study of crime, including anthropology, biology. I mean, think about like the body farm, where they Uh, bury bodies and they watch them decompose over time so they can build these forensic models. There are studies of discipline that are neurology based, political science, and economics. Now the Bartels identified three major disciplinary perspectives that I'd like to chat about for just a moment. And the first is the sociologically based criminology. It's a discipline Influenced by the sociology and anthropology fields, this perspective examines relationships in demographics and groups with variables toward crime and the structures of society. It examines culture in groups. It it looks at the culture and how these groups influence criminal behavior. An example might be something like a criminal gang. 
I mean, take uh, just a moment, folks. Let's pause for just a minute and record your thoughts down below in the description area about how you think criminal gangs might influence gang members to commit crime. Hey, make sure you're taking time to read each other's comments and that you're having some dialogue with one another. Well, hey folks, I'm pausing to share some concerns I have surrounding identity theft and fraud. I've learned a lot from our partner, Aura. They're the pros at protecting people from cyber predators. Aura provides identity theft protection, credit and fraud protection, and online and device security for you and your family. They taught me to think twice before answering those online questionnaires designed to steal our personal information. You know, it must be working because U.S. statistics show that 33% of us have been victimized by identity theft at an annual cost of more than $56 billion each year. Our protection plans come with around-the-clock support, a money-back guarantee, and a million-dollar theft policy. But here's the best part. You can try Aura for free by clicking on this special Profiling Evil link in the description down below. When you do, we get a small commission. But think about it. You insure your car and you insure your house. Don't you think it's time to insure your identity? Now let's get back to today's discussion. Well, I hope you enjoyed that little short exercise. Let's get back to this. The next perspective that I want to talk about is the psychological perspective which focuses on an individual's criminal behaviors. This looks at the behavior, the emotion, the mental process of the criminal themselves. Now, some people call this that nature versus nurture principle. I don't know. What do you think? I mean, can you grow up in a location or in a family where you're influenced by their behaviors, and that determines whether you become a criminal? Hey, finally, let's consider the psychiatric perspective, which examines the interplay between behavior and social environments. These traditional kinds of perspectives look for the unconscious and biological influencers of criminal behavior. Well, understanding criminal behavior starts with understanding crime problems. And defining and measuring crime is one of the biggest challenges facing criminologists. I mean, did the crime occur accidentally or intentionally? And my opinion would be most crime. The kind of crime you and I look at is intentional. Where did the crime occur? Who was the victim? Who was victimized by this particular criminal? In the United States, there are a few standardized crime measurement tools that we rely upon, and I put links to some of those down below. But let's explore them just a little bit deeper since we're talking about this issue. And by the way, make sure you take some time at the conclusion of this video to explore the strategies a little more deeply. Now, official police reports of crime and arrest are tabulated and forwarded to a report that's given to the FBI, the Federal Bureau of Investigations. And they include those statistics in their annual report. It's a National Crime Statistic Report, and it's called UCR, or Uniform Crime Report. Now, in the past decade, more police agencies have started reporting on a more robust FBI standard that's called NIBRS, or the National Incident-Based Reporting System. NIBRS is now the official reporting standard within the United States for crime data. But again, a lot of people are still using UCR. In addition to UCR and NIBRS, there are a number of valuable self-reporting studies where offenders even can report about offenses they've committed and how often they've committed them. There also are some national and some regionalized victimization studies which sample how often citizens have been victimized. And while the majority of crime statistics are based on adult offenses, it's necessary to also consider juvenile crime in the overall impact. We're going to talk specifically about juvenile crime and, 
and juvenile delinquency in one of the follow-up segments that we do here in this uh, segment of the Academy. But as we're having that discussion on juveniles, let's make sure we remember that not all offenses committed by juveniles are technically called crime. In some cases, in most places, they refer to crimes committed by juveniles as delinquency offenses, juvenile status offenses. Now, some examples of these kinds of offenses might be things like running away from home, curfew violation, underage drinking, or skipping school. These status offenses label the actor as delinquent because of the behaviors, not necessarily criminal in nature. Now, I'll let you decide if that makes sense to you or not, or if we're just making it easy on kids, which maybe we should at times. Again, think about that. Their brains haven't fully developed. Some may not have the kind of uh, oversight that they need to have. Some might get sucked into a gang where others really influence them before they start to create those capabilities of making decisions on their own. Well, anyway, let's get back to adults uh, because there's a major challenge when considering adult and juvenile crime. And it's, it's this balance that needs to be struck between antisocial behavior and criminal behavior. Antisocial behavior is sometimes called sociopathy, a, a mental disorder in which the person consistently shows no regard for right or wrong. We're going to talk a little more about that in one of the follow-up sessions when we talk about psychopathy and the difference between psychopathology. Now, these individuals ignore the rights and the feelings of others. This is the kind of individual who might antagonize, manipulate, or treat others harshly. They exhibit a real calloused indifference for others, and generally they show no or little remorse for their behaviors. Individuals who have these antisocial personality disorders often violate the law, and that makes them criminals. They might lie, behave violently or impulsively. They might have problems with drug and alcohol abuse. Because of these characteristics, people with this personality disorder typically can't fulfill responsibilities. Things like going to school, doing things or reacting or participating in healthy family dynamics, or in getting through school. Now, coming full circle, I guess crime just plain intrigues all of us because it harms people. It angers people. And sometimes when we study it, it entertains us. I don't know if that's the best thing. And I hope that what we're accomplishing here at Profiling Evil is that we're educating rather than just simply entertaining. And equally, when it's spotlighted by the media, crime often sensationalizes victimization. Theories of crime can be divided into understandably understandable classifications. Things between criminals, those who choose to violate the law, and those who just make mistakes, unknowingly do things against the law. Well, as we measure crime, we're going to be in a better position to understand trends and address problem areas like the community of disciplines that we talked about not just about law enforcement. Hey, in our next segment, we're going to talk about some of the origins of criminal behavior. But for now, I'd like you to think about the differences you think there are between psychological and sociological criminology. Think about some of the strategies that you've witnessed that provide crime control or crime prevention. Hey, go online and look at some of the national-based incident reporting systems or the Uniform Crime Report and see if you can identify the core difference between the two of them. Think about juveniles and consider the difference between criminal behavior and juvenile delinquency. I mean, here's the question. Should a juvenile delinquent be held to the same standard as an adult criminal? Hey, put your answer down below. And I hope you're enjoying this introduction into Season 3 of Profiling Evil's Academy. We're discussing criminal behavior in deeper detail. 
and I hope that you're going to take a moment and hit that like and subscribe button and ring the bell so that you get all of our videos, all of our notifications, all of our podcasts. Don't forget to check out Profiling Evil on your favorite podcast platform and visit ProfilingEvil.com so you can sign up for the BOLO. Now, folks, go back and watch some of our other videos in the Academy series, particularly take a look at nature versus nurture. What is it that causes some individuals to go out and commit crime? Hey, thanks for listening. We'll see you soon at the next crime scene.